as young clinicians start into their practice, they should keep an eye out for what is happening in the field. Because I always say that, you know, if something happens and your income has to be cut down by, say, 40% or 50% or something like that, you only have yourself to blame. Because the reality is, as a gastroenterologist, you're a specialist. You should know about this field more than anybody else. And if you can't see this change coming, you have only yourself to blame. You should be able to see this change coming. You should have a backup plan ready. And you should be able to move forward in any type of situation or scenario. Dr. Bara El Kurdi, thank you so much for coming on the Scope Forward show. I've been looking forward to having this conversation for a long time now, as you know. Very, very warm welcome. Thank you, Praveen. I'm happy to be here. I've been looking forward for this as well. Yeah. So let me have Jenny, my digital assistant, introduce you. I'm sure you can see her now. So Dr. Bara El Kurdi, an esteemed assistant professor of gastroenterology and hepatology at Virginia Tech Curlian School of Medicine. He's a dynamic medical educator, researcher, innovator, and entrepreneur. Dr. El Kurdi began his journey at the University of Jordan, then ventured to the Mayo Clinic in Arizona for clinical research and medical device development. He continued to shine during his internal medicine residency at East Tennessee State University, where he founded the Quillen College of Medicine Research Society. His passion for gastroenterology led him to the University of Texas in San Antonio, earning him the prestigious Editor-in-Chief Award for two consecutive years. He's also the creator of the GI Startup Podcast, Exploring Innovation in Gastroenterology. Today, Dr. L. Curdy is a respected reviewer for top gastroenterology journals, advises health tech startups, and contributes to the American College of Gastroenterology Innovation and Technology Committee. With over 23 PubMed Index publications, his research has made a lasting impact in gastroenterology. Driven by innovation, he now heads a startup focused on harnessing artificial intelligence's potential in healthcare. Get ready to be inspired by the remarkable Dr. Bara L. Curdy. She does a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Your assistant, assistant is, is too kind, I think. That's way too much. But that's pretty cool. Let's start you know, with the GI startup podcast. I was really excited when I first saw it pop up on my LinkedIn feed. And you've done a bunch of interviews of innovators across the field in gastroenterology. I want to start by asking you, Bara, what did you learn from all these different conversations? What's going on as far as innovation in GI is concerned? I think I've learned a lot, honestly. I could even say that I learned as much as I learned in my GI fellowship for the past three years from doing these GI startup podcast interviews. I think what I've learned is that there is a lot happening in GI. GI field is changing a lot and it's really ripe for disruption. And I think that there are a lot of people working on a lot of different things, a really vast, vast, vast specialty. So if you think about GI, we always think about endoscopy and endoscopic tools, but there is a lot more to GI than just that. So we have a lot of innovation happening in digital health. We have a lot of innovation happening in the IBS space. We have a lot of innovation happening in the IBD space, a lot of innovation with imaging and a lot of innovation, of course, with devices. But when we talk about devices, there is also so much going on when you talk about things like bariatric endoscopy and third space endoscopy. These are completely different fields and the tools that are used in any of these are very different. And there is a lot of innovation happening in all of that. But at the same time, there are a lot of people working on simple things like computer vision, artificial intelligence, assistive polyp detection and polyp characterization. But now we're moving even farther than that. And we're looking at things like dysplasia with Barrett's esophagus and IBD and seeing if computer vision can assist with that. It's really almost overwhelming because when I started doing the podcast, I was thinking that I might only have material for one year and I was planning on releasing one episode a month. And so I thought I might only have 12 episodes, but almost three months into it, I started getting so many emails about people interested in participating that I can't even see how far this would go because I already 
I think four months into it, I had about five years worth of interviews <laughs> already lined up. And it was just eye-opening because you don't know how many people are working on how many interesting things and how much potential there is into the field until you start to actually look into it. You know, sometimes even if you look into it, you won't know about a lot of other people that have, for example, reached out to me and I didn't even know that they were working on one thing or another. The other thing that I learned is that the GI environment doesn't just exist in America, not even just in Europe. Um, there is an amazing degree of innovation happening in places like New Zealand and Australia and India and Japan. There's a lot of great stuff happening in the Middle East. And so it's very interesting to see how vast the field is and how much innovation is happening. And I think that it's really essential for GIs in general, particularly for clinicians, as well as clinicians in training, like fellows, to really get involved in that, really start looking around. Again, the GI field is ripe for innovation. I always say that GI is kind of hanging by the thread of colonoscopy. And at some point, if CMS decides that, you know what, I'm not going to pay that much for colonoscopies, that's going to make massive changes to the entire GI ecosystem. Because most of our income, either as gastroenterologists or even as industry, is just built on this cornerstone. And so we need to be prepared for that. And the groundwork is already being done. So if you look again at the vast amount of innovation that is happening within the GI space, you will see that there are replacements available for colonoscopy, but there's also a lot of room to expand into other areas, which can be great sources of income and revenue and can keep the ecosystem alive. And so I think that as young clinicians start into their practice, they should keep an eye out for what is happening in the field. Because I always say that, you know, if something happens and your income has to be cut down by say 40% or 50% or something like that, you only have yourself to blame because the reality is as a gastroenterologist, you're a specialist, you should know about this field more than anybody else. And if you can't see this change coming, you have only yourself to blame. You should be able to see this change coming. You should have a backup plan ready and you should be able to move forward in any type of situation or scenario. Because again, this is your field, it's your specialty. You should know about it more than anybody else. Awesome. I think that sets a beautiful context for a whole bunch of questions that I want to ask you. But let's play a game, Bara. I want you to imagine a curve and let's call it the aging curve. And mm -hmm. as it applies to humans, it also applies to industries. So this aging curve, a semicircle curve, starting with birth and adolescence, and growth and you're in your prime right in the middle and to the right side of the curve is aging and after aging as we all know comes entropy and then death so if you have to critically or objectively view the industry of gastroenterology and i'm not just saying clinicians but everything you know you put everything into the gi space where would you put a dot on this aging curve at which point I kind of disagree with the way that the curve is described, because I do agree that innovation for a particular, say, device can go in that direction. So you can say, for example, when we think of something like nephrology and we think of dialysis, we've gotten to a point where you can't really do much anymore with dialysis. So innovation in dialysis is pretty much dead, right? It went through a great deal of innovation when the dialysis machine used to be an entire room to a degree now where the dialysis machine is very simple and you can actually do dialysis at home and there are companies that do that. But there isn't much that you can do now in dialysis. However, during the same time that this was happening, there was a lot of other innovation in nephrology that included renal transplant and uh, living donor renal transplant and deceased donor renal transplant. and the fact that the dialysis part of the equation died out didn't mean that innovation died out. And I think in GI in general, this same thing can happen. And so when you think about endoscope design, it actually has undergone massive transformation 
from when it started, where, you know, it started at rigid and you had to look with an eyepiece and then it became flexible. And then over time, we were able to add a lot more to it in having a screen and then an HD screen and so on and so forth. And now we have all these cool new attachment that we can add to it. At some point, one could have said that, okay, this is the endoscope, it's gone, the innovation in endoscopy is dead. However, we have created an entire ecosystem of endoscope attachments that create this massive amount of innovation that you can do to the point that we're pretty much doing surgery through luminal GI with the endoscopic ultrasound attachments, for example, allowing you to drain abscesses and create pretty much artificial to bypass an obstruction and to artificially create a gastric bypass uh, kind of uh, surgical intervention. And so just describing the innovation curve as a curve where it starts at some point and then dies out. It may be accurate in a limited way, but it's actually inaccurate in a larger sense, because as long as there are people who are trying to innovate, who believe that we can create something better, they will actually find a way. I love your response. So let me start there. I love your response and I'm with you. However, if you consider the average private practice gastroenterology, where would you plot it? That's a really good question. I don't think there is much happening. I think that we've gotten to a sweet spot. And unfortunately, we've kind of gotten complacent, right? Because we've gotten to a point where people know that they can make a lot of money just going there every day and scoping, just scoping for dollars, just, you know, being a technician pretty much where you can go in, scope every day, almost out of the week, maybe do a half day of clinic and then just scope the rest of the time. And you will make a very, 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 very good living. And because of that, people have gotten complacent. And I think they're not branching out. I think there's both a systematic problem as well as more of a problem of the tragedy of the commons where people are like, okay, I don't care what happens to everybody else. I'm just going to take advantage of this situation where I know that I can do this many colonoscopies and make that much money. But also there's this systematic problem where it's not giving us much incentive to innovate. And it's not giving those, you know, average, small scale private practices that much incentive to innovate. Things are changing. Our reimbursements are getting cut down almost on a yearly basis. And so people will start to look into other avenues, I think. I think that we just need that push. But unfortunately, because of the situation that we're in right now, if the reimbursement is cut abruptly, a lot of places will suffer catastrophic, I think, consequences. Hopefully that will not happen, and I don't think it will. But I do hope that we will be able to start integrating more and more innovation into small scale practices. And I do believe that digital health in particular offers a lot of room within that area. I think there is hope. But <laughs> You made a career change recently. Why didn't you choose private practice GI? You chose a hybrid model so that you can innovate better. People out there want to know how you made the choices that you made, apart from, you know, family and personal reasons, what were the professional or industrial reasons for you to go down the path that you did? It certainly, and it was certainly very appealing to go into private practice. The difference in numbers on the paycheck that you're going to get at the end of the month, every month is a good enough reason for most people to go into private practice. Not to say that that's the only reason. Of course, private practice is absolutely essential. There is a shortage of gastroenterologists. We need to screen so many people and we don't have enough gastroenterologists to do it. And so but private practice is still noble by all means. I think for me, when I started looking at how I want my career to go, I thought that I'm more interested in contributing in a different way. I'm more interested in innovating and creating devices, but also helping develop devices and not just devices, but also, you know, the entire spectrum of healthcare innovation through digital health means or uh, digital therapeutics or artificial intelligence products, so on and so forth. And so. I started thinking about whether private practice was the right environment to do that. And there are a lot of private practice groups that do participate in research 
it may not have been the best because a lot of these practices also target profit with the research endeavors that they go through. And again, it's still essential not to say that it's not, you know, doing clinical trials for IBD is certainly both essential for GI development and for the health of our patients in general, for the well-being of our patients, but it's also lucrative. I started looking into places where I could practice clinical gastroenterology and at the same time be able to innovate through interaction with biomedical engineers, electrical engineers, with computer science majors and software engineers. And I found out that the best way to do that is to be in a kind of hybrid practice where you're not completely employed by a university, but at the same time, you're working a practice that has a very good affiliation with a university program that has these capabilities. I think, you know, the Virginia Tech Carillion Clinic was a very, very good match for that. They have a very good biomedical engineering school, very good biomedical engineering program. And I think that interaction is probably going to provide the best means for me to be able to kind of bridge the gap between clinical gastroenterology and innovation slash research. Well done and congratulations to you uh, for going down that path and having the courage, frankly, to do that because it's not easy. You know, as a case in point, I meet many gastroenterologists uh, who are quite advanced in their career. And I mean, I hate to use the word stuck, but they are stuck uh, in an existing model of GI care. They're so innovative as individuals and people. They have all these bunch of ideas but they just can't wean themselves out of the endoscopy room. They just can't. They don't have the time and uh, they're too exhausted uh, by the end of it. And I've seen people for a few years, I can see all that innovation not coming to bear. And it is sad. It's actually quite sad for the industry more than anything else. I completely agree and I completely understand that that was always in the back of my head. Like, I don't want to be one of these people. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to wake up in 20, 30 years and think, oh, why did I do this? Or I don't have time to go after the ideas that I have. But also I think something else plays a part in this. And that is the lack of training or education for clinicians in general, but also gastroenterologists about how to get your idea from the idea stage to an actual product. I think that Nobody really teaches us that. And therefore, we don't have much of a belief that if I have a good idea, I can actually make it into reality. And I think this is one of the biggest, biggest problems that we have and face. I think that there are a handful of academic institutions that could provide at least some exposure. If not, I'm not honestly aware of any structured program to teach fellows, for example, or residents how to do this. But there's a handful of academic institutions where this happens so often that people might get involved in it at an early stage in their career or during their training. But the vast majority of people who have, like you said, brilliant ideas and have had these brilliant ideas and been sitting on them for years, decades, and they never go anywhere just because they don't believe that if I have an idea, it matters. And maybe by the time that they figure out that it matters, like you said, they're already exhausted, they're already burnt out, they're already stuck in that endoscopy room, and they just don't have the time to make it into reality. Very well articulated. Uh, let me ask you this. A lot of people want to give advice to young GIs. They want to tell GI fellows what they need to do about their careers. I've seen young GIs look up, you know, at whatever has been happening. But that model, unfortunately, again, is 10, 15 years old, which is actively getting disrupted. Nobody wants to like really sit and listen to young gastroenterologists and ask a reverse question saying that, what is it exactly that you want? You know, I want to ask that question. What do young gastroenterologists want from the industry? I think there are, you know, different kinds of young gastroenterologists. There's the kind who... <laughs> just wants to get as many colonoscopies done before the system changes as they can retire <laughs> very well. And that's totally fine. Um, and then there is a kind of young gastroenterologist that doesn't really know what is happening with the entire GI ecosystem. And so they don't care. They're still 
kind of stuck in that mentality that made them go into GI in the first place, which is, you know, one of the best and most lucrative specialties that you can go into. And they are not really aware of what's going on. Third kind, I think, is the kind that this question goes to. The people who are aware and who want to do something about it, but feel like they cannot. And I think that for those people, what is really needed from the industry, but also from the GI societies in general, is to involve them more in what is happening within the GI space. It's very, very, very tempting, for example, a startup company to go to a key opinion leader who is, you know, has been practicing for 35 years or something because they have a lot of experience within that space. But the space is changing a lot. And most of these people don't have too much stake in what's going to happen to GI in the future. They have very little skin in the game. And I'm not trying to criticize anyone. I think, you know, almost everybody that I know who's a key opinion leader in GI is a great, great gastroenterologist and absolutely have made massive contributions. It's just young GIs have a lot more skin in the game. They're going to be in this field for the next 30, 40 years. And so they have a lot more stake to help develop the field in general. And so I feel like more involvement by these young physicians is going to pay off for everyone simply because they're going to see a future that a lot of older generation may not see simply because, you know, they've lived through a completely different GI environment and they don't see themselves practicing for much longer within a changing GI environment. Are they disillusioned? Right in the beginning of the career, I'm curious. I think everybody is disillusioned. Absolutely. I think that we have to look at this from, you know, the standpoint of how the field has evolved over the years. And I think that gastroenterologists, you know, before the scope was created, I had a few mentors that were GIs before there were scopes. And back then, GI was just a medical specialty like endocrinology. And then as endoscopes became a thing and then became ubiquitous and everybody had an endoscope and everybody was doing procedures, GI slowly transitioned from being just, you know, a cerebral physician into pretty much an endoscopy technician, <laughs> just doing endoscopic procedures all the time. And most of us, when we go in GI, honestly, you know, we're thinking about GI as science because we go into GI from internal medicine, right? If I wanted to do procedures and I wanted to use my hands all the time, I would have gone into surgery. But I went into medicine because I like the cerebral aspect of medicine. I like to get a differential diagnosis. I like to talk to my patients and treat patients medically. And so I go into GI, I'm excited about scoping, but I'm also excited about the cerebral aspect of it. Once I go into private practice in particular, but also in academic practices, they still want you to make money for the institution. You go in and you start noticing that most of your time is doing endoscopy. And it's not just most of your time doing endoscopy. There's always pressure on you to increase your endoscopy volume. There's always pressure on you to do more, to do more procedures, do more procedures, see more patients. And you know, that is in part happening because the reimbursement is dropping and therefore people want to close the gap of dropping reimbursement by increasing the volume. It's just something that a lot of us don't know. We get out of fellowship when we are doing a certain number of procedures per day and then you hit private practice, you start out, they start you slow. But by the end of that first year, if you've not become absolutely a machine, your reimbursement is going to drop. Your salary is going to drop. That guaranteed salary that they give you in the first year, if you can't make that base, your salary is going to drop. And so you're going to start feeling that pressure that I need to increase, I need to increase, I need to increase. And so I feel like this is a, definitely a source of disillusionment for a lot of young GIs. Very, very insightful comments, Bara. What do they think about private equity consolidation? Are they clear about it or are they confused? I think that there are a lot of opinions regarding that. There's a lot of data coming out about like increasing costs with consolidation and private equity. I think that, you know, generally speaking, 
most young GIs are not fully aware of what is happening from that standpoint. Because if you think about a medical doctor, depending on whether they started a job between their bachelor's degree and, and going into medical school. And I think it's a minority of medical students that do that. Most of them do pre-med and, and go into medical school right away. But most of us haven't really hit the job market until we graduate from medical school. And then we don't really go into the job market. You apply through the match system and you end up basically just being another type of student that's paid very low pay, but you do that. And you do that for three years in internal medicine residency. And then you go into fellowship and that's another type of student and <laughs> not really any type of job market. And then you graduate and your entire understanding of the job market is that I'm going to be an employee. And so you're not exposed to the idea of ownership of a practice. There is a physician own practice and you can buy into this particular practice and you can, you know, be part of the decision making and kind of stuff. So a lot of us will sign with hospitals, for example, even though it's not a great work environment because the paycheck is high. And then, you know, a lot of us don't understand what it means to have a private equity take over this particular practice, or you're going to be working in a practice that is owned by uh, private equity. And so I think that there's a lot of confusion about that. I think that we all could benefit from some clarity about what it means for private equity to acquire, you know, so-and-so practices. Then what's going to happen in five years when they sell it? And how is that going to affect the physicians that are working there every day? Another question, like, so in your education and, you know, you know for young GIs, how much of exposure of AI is there? I think that GI Genius hit the market recently. It's been out for a while now, and it was picked up very quickly, I think, by a lot of academic institutions. So I think at least from a standpoint of polyp detection, there is a decent exposure and it's growing. And as the other products from other companies start hitting the market in the next year or so, we're going to see a lot more adoption of that. There are a lot of fears about this making doctors complacent and not do a great examination. But, you know, I think this is just going to be ubiquitous. It's going to be exactly like endoscopy going from standard definition to HD. And basically, it's just going to be the way that everybody's going to scope from now on. But I think beyond that, the, our exposure to artificial intelligence is in training is extremely limited, extremely limited. And we have a group of friends that are interested in this, have started an AI and GI um, interest group for early career gastroenterologists in order to start thinking about how we can integrate this in a more systematic way for gastroenterologists in general. I think ASGE is working on that as well. I think we're going to be working on that with the um, AGA technology, um, AGA Innovation and Technology Committee, as well as with the ACG to try and build a more comprehensive curriculum for GIs so that they can understand what's going to happen from, you know, the advent of artificial intelligence and involving that um, into everyday practice. There are still ways in which GIs can interact with that. So, you know, just like everybody else in the world, GIs have been using ChatGPT and BARD and uh, They've been using, for example, Doximity tools. Doximity has a whole bunch of tools that they've released that utilize GPT. I believe they're using GPT 3.5 for their tools. There's a lot of talk about other products and what could happen. Hopefully, hopefully I think in the next few years, we're going to have a more structured curriculum for GIs in training. Now, though, to answer your question, I think there's very, very, very little exposure. I want to shift gears to another topic and get to your startup you know, that you're involved in. But before I do that, I want you to about, uh, present the landscape of AI in GI. There is a massive, massive, massive transformation happening. And I think that we're going to see an immense amount of AI products in the GI space. I think over time, they will drop down to not a few, but they will drop 
certainly in number. I think that right now there are way too many of them and a lot of them may not be particularly helpful. But if we look at AI and GI, I think that we can look at things in terms of endoscopic applications and then non-endoscopic applications and non-endoscopic applications can be divided into computer vision applications and natural language processing applications. So if we look at endoscopic, we're mostly talking about computer vision because it's a camera. And so within that space, there is a lot that is happening in terms of diagnosis. And so, you know, polyp detection and characterization, but in addition to that, things like inflammatory bowel disease, activity assessment, inflammatory bowel disease, um, dysplasia assessment, Barrett's esophagus dysplasia assessment, but also we're looking at using computer vision during endoscopy in order to recruit patients for clinical trials, particularly in the IBD space. And so basically looking at the morphology of the disease that they have and determining if they're good candidates for clinical trials, these particular applications will probably end up incorporating a lot of additional data like so it won't just be computer vision, but it'll in incorporate data like the patient's age and gender, their comorbidities, what medications they've been on. And so there will be some part of processing involved in that. But in addition to that, I've been talking to some people recently about the possibility of instead of having a model that addresses everyone all the time, we can have smaller models that address particular populations. And what I mean by that is you know, there's always a question about bias of the training data sets. So just for example, based on race, um, you could, you, you know, expect that certain races will have less people in their training data sets. And so they are underrepresented. But what you could do is you could have the model hone in on their particular race within the training data set when you're doing an endoscopy for this particular person. And that way you kind of reduce um, the bias. And so we might see things like this in the future, but I think that this is going to be a little far in the future. It's going to be a bit of an investment um, and there isn't that much return on any of these products yet. So that's the endoscopic part. I think there are so many applications. My only concern about it is the question of reimbursement, which is who's going to pay for this. We don't have any reimbursement structure for now, but I've been talking with some people recently and, and looks like there is work towards getting some sort of reimbursement structure for these technologies. Outside of endoscopy, I think there are computer vision applications that relate to basically workflow. So if you look at, for example, optimizing work and time within the endoscopy suite of how long does it take to clean rooms and how long does it take to roll the patient in and roll the patient out. These kind of stuff can be done using computer vision, but also you can look at computer vision from the standpoint of imaging. Imaging within the GI space, particularly within the IBD space, companies working on MR interrography and CT interrographies and interpreting these and finding fistulas and that kind of stuff trying to find response to therapy early on. And then once you get out of computer vision, they are, start talking about large language models and natural language processing, as well as some of the other AI applications. You look at either diagnostic models or workflow optimization. So diagnostic models, it's a massive space because pretty much you can enhance the diagnosis of pretty much everything by adding an AI model that can look at a vast amount of data, including something that we've never been able to look at before, which is unstructured data in clinical notes in order to come up with a diagnosis. And so there are so many of these. I don't know how many of these are going to make and are going to be better than what we use now, but I think that at least some of them will be. And then the next step after diagnosis is going to be decision support. And so basically is collecting this vast amount of data and then telling you, for example, that the best course of action is probably going to be this. And then, of course, a clinician can, can determine if this is the, the best course of action or, or something different might be. But basically diagnosis and clinical decision support. And then the last thing is going to be workflow, which is things like ambient documentation in the clinic, things like writing your notes for your endoscopy procedure 
as you're doing a procedure where I think that iterative health already has a product that can um, determine what tools were used and it'll structure a little bit of a uh, note for you, but you can also speak a few things out loud and then that'll act as a ambient documentation and create a note for you. Uh, but in addition to that, there can be other supportive tools like prior authorization generators, basically dealing with your in-basket, for example, if, if you're working with Epic or whatever my chart equivalent that you might have with your EMR. So again, vast, vast field of, of innovation in, in AI. It's super response, Bara, because I hope people who are watching, listening would rewind and listen to this because I'm thinking there are at least 50 different uh, GI startup ideas in uh, what you just said. There's uh, no, you know, dearth for revenues or innovate in the field. Let me get to your startup. I know, you know, it's in stealth mode, so whatever you can share. So please uh, tell us about what your startup does. The startup it basically came out of uh, my own frustration. You know, as a young gastroenterologist, I want to be able to practice for as long as I can. And when I started hearing about endoscopy-related musculoskeletal injury, I got really worried because I was looking at the numbers and the numbers show anywhere between 50 to 75% of gastroenterologists it's more like 75% because that's the largest survey that we have showed that 75% of gastroenterologists end up with endoscopy related musculoskeletal injury. And looking at that as a young guy, I'm like, my chances are terrible. <laughs> I don't want to suffer through this. I want to have a solution. I asked a lot of people, I couldn't really get great insight. All the recommendations boil down to this single picture that we see in pretty much every ergonomics lecture that we have of an endoscopist basically telling you that you need to stand upright and put the bed at a so-and-so height and put the screen at a so-and-so height and so-and-so distance. And I felt like this was not enough because, you know, once a year we would get a lecture about ergonomics that would last about maybe 15 minutes. And then after that, nobody talks to you about it. And so maybe for three days after you get the lecture, you kind of pay attention to what you're doing. But then after that, your old habits kick in and you just get into it, you know, and you just do what you're used to doing. And after a while, I started feeling pains <laughs> and I started thinking, okay, this is not good. I need to figure things out. I started asking people about exercises that they do to prevent injury. There was absolutely no guidance. There were a couple of videos from ASGE, but you know, I still felt like that was not enough. And so I started thinking about what can we do to provide continuous monitoring, to provide you with continuous feedback, with a complete analysis of what you're doing wrong, what you're doing right in the endoscopy suite, which joints are more likely to be injured and what you need to do to fix that. It took me a while, but... <laughs> We finally were able to create a computer vision program that can analyze posture for the endoscopist in the endoscopy suite as they perform their procedures, and then come up with a comprehensive analysis of their posture, calculate the risk of injury through some of the validated skeletal injury risk assessment tools, and then in addition to that, provide a risk assessment for every particular joint um, in their body, and then it'll give them feedback on what they're doing wrong, how they can correct it. Uh, but I also partnered with a sports medicine uh, physician and a rehab physician to come up with an exercise program that is tailor-made for GIs and what we do in the endoscopy suite based on the same injury prevention principles that are used in sports medicine. So what I was thinking is, you know, you have a basketball player that jumps up and down and runs and does, you know, all kinds of risky activity for their joints for years and years and years. And how do they deal with their risk of injury? How do they deal with the risk of repetitive stress injury that we always talk about in GI? Because they do have repetitive stress. We know that for sure. And start looking at sports medicine literature, this is a problem that has already been addressed in sports medicine. We just have never adopted those principles. And so we use the same principles that they use for athletes for the gastroenterologist and the movements that we do. 
And then we incorporated that into the software so that the software can determine what are your riskiest areas and then give you particular exercises that you can do to prevent injuries in those areas. And so once this was done and built, I decided that this was a good thing to create a company um, around. But once we created that, I felt like there are a lot of other artificial intelligence applications that I want to work on and I want to contribute to the GI space with. And, you know, honestly, I didn't want to build 15 startups. <laughs> so I made the decision that we'll have a single startup that looks at AI and GI, but we'll have multiple products. And so the ergonomics product will be one part, and then we'll have a bunch of other parts that are working basically on workflow optimization and hopefully reimbursement optimization as well. Very nice, Bara, and all the best for this startup initiative. Just one comment on the ergonomics, but based on, again, my observations, psychology has got a huge role to play here. What I've observed with physicians, gastroenterologists in particular, it's uncool to talk about your pains, so they don't talk about it. And you see it typically strike at some point in the 50s, so one endoscopist told me that, you know, the pain radiates all from here, goes all the way to the shoulder. It's repetitive injury, like you talked about it, but the whole challenge is no one speaks about it. And then they check out, they check out of medicine altogether because the body can't take it any longer. Uh, they're also wearing this heavy radiation equipment that's causing back pain. But again, it'll be so uncool to say that, you know, you're not a superhero and <laughs> trying to fight Absolutely. it. People think that if you are having pain from endoscopy, that you are not a good endoscopist. And so they are scared to talk about it. I completely agree. And it's just so unhealthy. How is that? I mean, I keep saying that in GI, we have quality measures for how will you do endoscopy for the patient, right? So we have things like adenoma detection rate, and it basically assesses how good you are at detecting lesions in colonoscopy. But we don't have any quality measures that tell us how will you do the procedure for yourself. And we really need that. Because if you have an adenoma detection rate of 100, but you break your back while you're doing it, you're doing everybody a disservice. You're basically losing years of practice. Your patients are losing access to you at an earlier stage. And that's so bad. We have a shortage of gastroenterologists. We need to keep working for as long as possible, for as long as we can. And we need to do it painlessly. <laughs> And so it's really important for people to start taking this more and more seriously. And I think there's a very good movement, a very big movement in GI towards that. Just a few days ago, ASGE released the first ever guidelines in GI for ergonomics. And so there's a very big push within the GI community to take this problem more seriously. And hopefully, hopefully we'll get to a point where we're going to get some good innovation to solve this problem. I'm so glad, uh, Bara, and glad that uh, you're also bringing attention to this important area. So my final question to you, and I ask this question often on the Scope Forward show, uh, even though this entire conversation has been about the future of GI, if I have to ask you the question, what is the future of gastroenterology from everything that you know, everything that you're seeing, what would you say? I think there is great future for GI. There's so much happening and the field is so vast that it's extremely difficult for GI to have a bad future, if that makes sense. I think that, you know, although colonoscopy and screening is this really, really, really big part of what we do, there is a lot more to it than that. GI in general, I'm always shocked at why it's it's considered a single specialty, right? So if you think at other specialties in medicine, you look at cardiology and it's just one organ. You look at pulmonology, for example, and it's just one organ. You look at GI and then you have pretty much like 10 organs. You have the esophagus, which is its own organ, the stomach, which is its own organ, and then the small bowel, which Sure, you can consider one organ, but it's actually multiple because they function completely differently. You have the liver that is a completely different organ, the pancreas, the colon is a, is a different organ. And so it's just so vast and there is so much happening in every single one of these areas. And there's so much innovation in every one of these that it's extremely difficult 
for GI to have a bad future. I think that there is a bright future. I'm hoping that the future is going to contain us maybe having less pressure to do procedures. Hopefully the change in colonoscopy reimbursement is actually going to be a good change because it will reduce the burden on gastroenterologists, but it'll also open additional avenues for us to, you know, spend more time with our patients to actually contribute better to the health of the community overall. And if you look at technologies and what they're doing, I think that doing just that, we're building technologies that are hopefully going to make, for example, colonoscopy a lot easier. Whether that's interventional innovation through devices that can help resect large polyps, or whether that's through artificial intelligence, computer vision based that can help us detect lesions better and faster, and maybe even cut them and not retrieve them if we have really good polyp characterization software. Or that's through, for example, stool testing that may reduce the burden of uh, colonoscopy altogether. And then other aspects of innovation like ambient documentation will hopefully take some of our time back from sitting at the computer screen and typing endlessly. And at the same time, digital health hopefully will give us the chance to reach more and more people and give more and more to the community. So hopefully the future of GI will be better for everyone, for physicians and patients and communities. Awesome. Dr. Bara el thank you so much for coming on the Scope Forward show. It's been fantastic. And uh, thank you for answering all these different questions quite directly and openly. It's going to be so helpful for people listening or watching. Thank you. Thank you, Praveen. Thank you for having me. This has been an awesome conversation. I love it.